right? Internet. Yet again, we meet. And this time, we beat the challenge without directly cheating on the other YouTube series. So this is our surprise face, and we we're very excited that we didn't necessarily directly cheat. We um, read around the vulnerability and then fig thought, figured out, <laughs> figured out, figured out how to specifically solve the challenge ourselves. So with that being stated, what is the challenge? Well, the challenge is called token. And specifically in this challenge, we're given 20 tokens from the graceful gods that de deployed this contract. So they allowed us to have 20 tokens in that deployment, or maybe they transferred to us later on, we don't know. And the goal here is basically to get our hands on additional tokens, preferably a large amount of tokens. That's really the challenge. And they give us a hint here, and they basically state a question of saying, what is an odometer? So first things first, when I, when I saw this, I just said, okay, I have an idea. I know an odometer sits inside of a car, but how is, how is that relevant to this? Um, you know, do a little googs, do some googs, and you'll see that a lot of these have been read. I've read most of these. And they're all correlating to a specific type of attack, which is overflows and underflows. And specifically in this challenge, we're focusing on integer underflows and overflows, not buffer underflows and overflows, which even though they're somewhat similar in the way that they're implemented and kind of executed, we're talking about integers right now. And when speaking about this, you'll see a lot of people refer to odometers. And here's a great photo. It has nothing to do with uh, what I'm going to talk about, but I just thought it was good. And there's a overflowing barrels and a really cool medieval looking dude. Um, but we're looking at uh, odometers. So within your car, you have an odometer. And in that odometer, there's a series of slots, right? There's only a number of uh, slots here that can be utilized. And once you've gotten to the limit of how many miles that can be clocked on the so side of the odometer, it's gonna then clock back over. And once it gets down, it's gonna go to zero. It's not gonna go to the next slot because it doesn't exist, obviously. Now, that same premise and ethos with odometers applies to the way that your integers are stored within memory. So here's an example, right? In this example, we have a 256-bit uh, uh, example. And this obviously is a lot larger. It's not going to be this small. So those dots, just imagine this graph being massive. And we have two theoretical numbers here. So we have a theoretical number A and a theoretical number B. We're going to add those together. And we're going to get theoretical number C. And number C is actually going to exceed the number of slots we have here. Now, once you've exceeded that, you would assume that this would be in place and you would have that next larger number. But since we don't have that number of slots and we have a strict boundary on how far we can go out, it's then going to clock back over and it's going to go to zero. So we've overflowed that integer back into itself. So it's, it's cyclical, it's circled back on itself. And you can do the same process in ethos, but backwards. So if you subtracted from the lowest number, so if you had zero and you subtracted one from zero, that's going to loop back on itself and it's going to get you to the highest number instead of the lowest. So that's kind of the ethos and the premise of the integer underflow overflow kind of situation. And when digging through this, I uh, asked myself a series of questions. Um, the first one was figuring out specifically uh, how are integers stored, first of all, and then what are their limits? So I really wanted to kind of understand the, the fundamental assumptions that were baked into this challenge of how someone should kind of intuit this stuff when reading it and understanding it. So there's a series of resources that I'll share with you as per usual, I always do. Um, this specific one really does a good job at talking about how, int how integers are stored within memory. So that's a good one to kind of dive into. Uh, another one that I have here is going to be this article. So I read probably 10 to 12 articles around this topic, and this is probably one of the best that I found, just due to the fact that it's not solely focused on Solidity, but it's focused on a lot of programming language. And it talks a lot about kind of the history and the reasonings why this is a flaw and a series of other things. So I recommend this article like times 10. So you should definitely check this one out. Um, there's an example in here I wanted to show you here. So we can see here, they're talking about the same exact thing I've just shown you in the other graph, but just with digits. So you can see that um, here we have a, a 6,000, 65,000 blah, 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 blah bits. This is displayed in binary as such. And if we add one to this max, we're actually going to clock that back to zero. We're going to go back in here. We would assume that if it wasn't restricted and didn't have boundaries to the number of slots that are within that memory array, um, you would have the additional one that would be tacked on. That's the, uh, that's what you think, what, that's what we would normally expect. But in the end, it's just going to circle back. Um, some other interesting bits about this article that I found interesting. I think if we go down, try not to make you sick. Okay, here's, here's some interesting things I wanted to point in this article. Um, not directly related to the challenge, but definitely worth reading. 
Um, near the end of this blog was a talk about how buffer and integer overflows are somewhat similar, but also different. So that's something that I found interesting and I think you might find interesting as well. So definitely read that section. And also another really interesting piece down here is examples. So real life examples of this stuff happening. And I didn't know this because I didn't take the time to read this, um, but the Pegasus spyware that happened very recently in March, 2021, and this is 2022, February. Um, and this was a very advanced attack that was a zero click exploit. So that's super duper scary. And if we read through here near the end, you'll see that this is actually uh, in relation to an integer. There was an integer underflow that happened here. And I've literally just skipped over everything. We're just gonna jump right down here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so you can see basically here it states that the, the, the cyber attack was exploited via an inter, integer overflow within Apple's uh, core graphics image rendering library. So that is crazy. Uh, another one that they talked through is uh, Stage Fright, which was another situation, Microsoft and their attack with integer overflows. But here's an Ethereum one. That was a, a recent one for uh, Peck Shield. So this specific smart contract was uh, impacted by an integer overflow attack. So it's definitely a good article. You should check it out. It's worth the time and the reading if you're interested in learning more about this. Uh, another one is this YouTube. Uh, this is basically a YouTube channel, something you should subscribe to and just watch all the videos. Um, but they talk specifically here around binary, uh, addition within binary and overflows encompassed within that. So it's another good one. And within here, uh, this article here, they specifically talk through some of the bits around how bits are stored. So we're used to, within Solidity, seeing the uint uh, item here. So u, I think, means unassigned integer, and that basically refers to the fact that there is no negative numbers here. So uint doesn't allow you to go below zero. So we have zero, we have negatives, and there are positives up here. So uint doesn't allow you to go below this. You're always gonna have positive numbers. Int, on the other hand, allows negative numbers. And what we can see here is basically it's a breakdown of the bits associated to the uint eight. So the uint 8 refers to 255 bits, 16 is this number of bits, 24 this number, and then 256 is this number. Now, this number minus one, sorry, let's complete that statement. So it's 256, two raised to the 256 minus one. So you don't want to get to the max, but you just want to get right below that. And that was um, kind of a good understanding because it'll help you shape the way you think about solving this challenge. Um, another bit here uh, is another just graph that I found that helps intuit and understand how specifically integers are stored within a memory slot. And here you can see the basically positive numbers have a zero, I think it's MS, so most, most significant bit, which is what MSB stands for. So zero is referring to positive, and then one is referring to negative. And then they go through this concept of called one's complement and two's complement, but I'm not gonna explain that here, just know that that's the way that it sits, that's the way that it sits within binary, and that's what you would kind of depict of an integer sitting inside of a memory slot. All right, so we've gone through a lot of resources. Um, here are a series of resources that explain the attacks themselves or, or types like them. Uh, so this actually is a blog post, but this blog post specifically talks to an example of this attack. And this is the example that a lot of people utilize when reading through the articles. Um, so just to know that and also that example I just showed you there is explained specifically here through video format from you know our favorite YouTube channel channel when it comes to smart contract stuff. So that's that and some other stuff is this example obviously so this is the series that we've watched and it's been useful and it still is and that was he gave a great example. Um, some other bits here that I wanted to share are not actually related to integer overflows but these are referring to buffer overflows. Um, these are both definitely relevant, uh, not specific to this challenge, but in general. And this is a, see, he says it's a simple buffer low exploit, but in comparison to what we're doing here, it's actually super duper um, complex because of the way that kind of it works and how you have to track assembly and all that stuff. But some examples, you should check them out. And the fix. So we'll come to the fix later. Let's look at the challenge. So here is the code, right, for a challenge. I've copied and pasted it directly from the website here. And if we look at our code here, I'm gonna break it down for you. Now, as per always, we have our 
Pragma compiler and it's at 6.0. Remember floating point is bad, don't do that. Make sure it's set at static so it'd be 0.60, not floating. Uh, we have a contract called token and we have a few things. So we have a few state variables and these state variables, one is a mapping for balances. So this is basically saying that this address contains this amount of funding. Now remember that uint is the integer concept that we're gonna overflow or underflow, depending on how you wanna approach this. And remember uint does not allow negative numbers, only positive. Additionally, the uint alias, you can see that we're just doing uint. There is no number afterwards, right? It's just uint by itself. Well, within Solidity, when you do that, it's actually gonna to defer to 256. It's not gonna be uint 8, 32, whatever. It's gonna be 256. So those are all items that you wanna keep in mind when kind of thinking through this. So we have our mapping. Additionally, we have a total supply. So this is basically just another uint for the total supply. Now we have our constructor. Now when this is deployed, the individual that's deploying it, they're actually gonna uh, include an initial supply. That initial supply is then gonna be the total supply. And that sender is gonna have that balance associated to themselves. So the sender is gonna have the total supply as our initial supply. So like I said previously, uh, they gracefully gave us 20 tokens. So when you get a new instance, some, some time in that period, they're gonna transfer you 20 tokens. Now we have our function for transfer and in transfer, we're doing a few things here. So we're gonna to transfer to an address. We're gonna transfer a certain amount of value that's public and it returns a Boolean. Now this Boolean being returned true, the reason it's returning true is because we're having a few checks here, right? So the initial check here that's gonna occur is basically saying that the sender, the sender's balance minus the value that you're sending has to be over zero. So say if I'm sending, say I'm sending 20 tokens, so much many tokens we have, the amount of value that we send has to be over zero. So we can't send more than 20. So if we tried to send 25, we would do the balance. So we say our balance is 20 minus 25, which is the value we're sending. And that's going to equal negative five. So that's a no-no. That requires statement would fail and we would actually not, we would not pass go, right? But the thing here is that, remember how I stated that the uint can't go below zero. It can't be negative. It only can be positive. So that's going to play in our favor here. Reason being is that once we've gone through this, we're going to see our sender's balance. They're going to minus, they're going to minus that value from our balance. So we've sent 20, are going to take 20 away and they're going to give 20 to the person we're sending it to. And then we're going to return true. Now I'm going to explain kind of why this is the case in a second. Now the next piece is the balance of. So this is a simple, a simple kind of helper function just to see how much your balance is. So the owner, the address that sends and ignites kind of this function, it's going to say what your balance is. So it's a public review returns. It's going to return your balance and it's going to check the owner's balance, right? And that's referring back to our mapping here. Now the initial way that I went about like fixing this or attacking this challenge was doing it through a convoluted complex method of actually writing my own little attack and then transferring a certain amount of funds and all that stuff. We're not gonna do it that way because I found a simpler way and that is the way that we'll do it because it's a lot easier. Um, so if we come in here and we go expand this up a bit. So first we'll look at the ABI for this contract and make sure that it's all good so we can see that we have uh, our constructor and the constructor is going to be the initial supply. So we've already talked about that or balance of. So we're going to get our balance back. We have our total supply and our transfer. So if we come here and we do balance of, and we're going to do player because that's us. We're going to see if we open this up that our balance is 20 and it's referring to the 20 tokens that we were so gracefully given within the beginning of this contract when it was deployed. Now, if we do another thing here, so let's do contract, I think it's total supply. Let's see what the total supply is. So you can see the total supply is 2 million, 2.1 million, right? 3, 21 million, okay. So 21 million tokens is the total supply. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna transfer funds and to transfer funds, we need to transfer it to a contract that is not ours. So we're gonna to want to go to the ethernot uh, ether scan and we're going to steal the contract address just so we have something to send it to. So let's go here 
and we'll take this contract. All right, so if we do a wait, and we're gonna do a transfer, but we need to do that on the contract. And we're gonna transfer it to this address, and we're going to do 20 plus one. So why are we doing 20 plus one? Well, we've already talked about this a bit, right? Where 20 is the max supply that we currently have. Now, the requirement that we saw earlier says that it can't go, go below zero. So if we add 20 to one, we're exceeding our max of what we can provide, and it's gonna then go negative. Right, it's going to go negative because we've done the arithmetic through the require statement, and then you know, 21 minus 20 is obviously negative. So that means what we're going to do is we're going to overflow the integer, the total supply, and we're going to exceed that within the 256 bit slot that we have because it's a UN alias. And once we've exceeded that, it's then going to give us a boatload of funds because it's going to go to the max and not the minimum. Because we've remember we've gone negative, we're not allowed to go negative with UNs, so we're going to get the max. That's kind of what's going to happen here, hopefully, if it, if, it, if it does what I expect it to. So we're sending our transfer. We're going to continue that, and then we're going to wait. Okay, so I think it's done. Next thing we want to do is we want to see what our balance is now. So we've already done this previously, and remember that it was 20. So if we go here and do balance again, expand this out, and you can see that we have a lot more. And 20 tokens and just to confirm this was the first balance of we had 20 now we have a crap ton so now that we've done that if we submit our instance it should allow us to pass so we will wait once more all right so looks like it completed and if we close this out you'll see that congratulations you've completed the challenge so they're going to do a lot of the explanation that we've already talked through obviously it's going to be very high level so you should definitely you know, go do your own research. But um, here you can see they're talking to specifically how to um, how to fix this with uh, with control statements such as this. Um, but in the end, a lot of people really use safe math from Open Zeppelin, and that's what I wanted to kind of link you to and show you here. So at the very end, after we've solved this, what's the fix? How do we solve? How do we how do we not do this? And that's going to be safe math from Open Zeppelin. Now there's obviously alternative methods to how to do this. Um, but I specifically wanted to show you this one because it's the most prevalent and it's the one that you'll see most often. So I've linked, I'll link below specifically the safe math uh, explanation within their documentation. And you can see here that there's a series of uh, add-ons that you can have here. So instead of just doing a plus or a minus, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna say, you know, my number, my variable, whatever, and then add another number or sub, subtract another number, a div. And what this is doing is it's calling another um, specific library function that you're pulling from safe math. And I've pulled up specifically the safe math uh, solidity file that you would import to your contract just to show you specifically under the covers what's happening and what checks are occurring with that addition or that sub or whatever when doing it and how it prevents this uh, integer overflow or underflow from occurring. So if we go specifically to the first one here, so this is addition. And to actually, let's take a step back. So you can see there's a series of functions here, which is try. So it's try add, try subtraction, try multiplication, blah, 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 blah. And if we go down here, you'll see add and then subtraction. So what you're doing is you're actually, um, you're gonna do your try first and then you'll execute this down here later on. So let's check the try for the add. And we can see specifically within the try here, and let me make it a little bigger. So with the try function, we're gonna take the two integers that you wanna add, so option A and option B, uh, internal pew, blah, 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 um, it's a, a true, true or false Boolean UN. Okay, so what's, what the check's gonna happen here? So the check's basically gonna say A plus B equals C, and we have to ensure that if C is greater than A, then, um, no, no, sorry, if C is less than A, then return false, otherwise return true, and then return, um, your answer C. Otherwise, return false and zero. So let's think this through. Say we have um, one plus two equals three, right? Now, if we check this and say, okay, one plus two equals three, and then we say, okay, three is C, so is three less than uh, two? 
No. Is three less than one? No. So we know that's true. That means we can go down here and we can send back the results. But what if we did this? What if we did one plus two equals one? Well, one is less than two, but it's equal to one. So the issue here is gonna be here. So we're gonna compare these, and if we compare those and we see that C is less than A, which is two, then we're gonna return false and zero. And now what this is doing is basically checking and ensuring that whatever answer you have, whatever response you're providing, doesn't go below zero. It's ne never negative, and you're never gonna overflow or underflow that situation here. So that's kind of how the try, try situation occurs within the safe math library. And with that being said, that's it. Internet, we did it. And I will see you on the next challenge, which is called delegation.